Okay, Father, we just thank you so much that you love us so much that you give us wor your word, your promises, and your warnings. And then you give us all that we need to prepare for those warnings, Father. And so I just thank you, Lord, that we're going to learn about some of those things today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So uh, we are doing a building your character. And uh, this line at the bottom is, so it outlasts everything else coming in life. And I just want to preface this uh, lesson here today with, I was thinking about um, a song that's so appropriate for today's lesson, and it's that one on the radio. I love it, I can't sing it, but it's, Jesus is coming, people get ready. You know that one? People get ready? Well, get ready, okay? So last week the question came up, what is character? And, and Weldo did a very good job, I thought, defining it, but um, just for everybody's answer, I will answer what the dictionaries kind of have. So character is the combination of traits that form the individual nature of a person. So all those things, you know, coming together in you, that your experiences of life, the things you have done, the commitments you have made, that is your character. It comes out in your life. So one feature is a characteristic. Okay, um, and so like uh, moral or ethical quality, um, we talk about a man with a fine or honorable character, and so sometimes you define people by their character. He's that guy is just a really a mean guy. That guy's a really loving person. That you know those kind of things, right? This person they're so giving, and you see that 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 character nature comes out in them, right? So we're we're talking about building your character through this series, um, so you can get through the days ahead. Um, so I had there as in personality, the character of a person consists of all the qualities they have that make them distinct from others. And we are all individuals in God's eyes and each other's eyes. Okay, so slideshow a little different. Uh, so Jesus wants these character traits to make up our character. So he gives us in 2 Peter chapter 1 a list of character traits that he's wanting us to develop within ourselves. So in 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 7, he says, and besides this, applying all diligence. So first of all, diligence is actually a character trait. You need to be diligent. You need to practice being diligent. So applying all diligence, add to your faith, virtue. So faith is a, a, a characteristic and virtue is one. I put them in the same line. Um, and virtue, if you look in some of the modern translations, which like I use New American Standard and we'll see in here, is moral excellence. So you want to work on your moral excellence. Then add, um, and to your virtue, add knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, which is self-control, and to temperance, patience, which is perseverance. It's, it's patient enduring. So when trials come, you need to be, not just a patience, but patience, it, in, enduring patience, right? And then to your patience add godliness, and to your godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. And that is the Greek word for agape love, the love of God. So um, obviously that comes from God, and we need to be seeking God to build that more and more into our character. So why is he telling us that we need to be diligent to be adding these things? Okay, this, these verses don't just happen on a, a, on a, a page that's just floating around. Right? He says, in verse 10, right after this, he says, if you do these things, you shall never fall. Well, why is he saying you shall never fall? What, what, what is the context of this scripture? What is this context of this passage? So what is the context of 2 Peter chapter 1? Anybody got a quick pop-up answer to that? Okay. Well, the answer, the context is it falls between 1 Peter, the book of 1 Peter, and the rest of 2 Peter. Okay? And that is actually the whole context here. So I want to start with this, this fact. All covenants are conditional. So when you go back, all the covenants God made, there's conditions applied. You know, if you do this, then I will do this. You know, I give you these promises, so walk in, walk in my word, do this. You know, he made promises to all the Hebrew children in Egypt. 
and they were going to go to this promised land, but how many of them made it to the promised land? Because some of them weren't doing the ifs to get the then, right? And so there's, there's conditions in the, in, the, in the covenants we have with God. So we're going to start, and we're going to rush through the context, just some highlights of, of what, where we're at and why he's telling us we need these characteristics. So in 1 Peter, he wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again, to obtain an inheritance. So there's an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. It's reserved in heaven, okay? So you have an inheritance reserved in heaven. You who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation, uh, it's for you, uh, it's ready to be revealed in the last time. So it's in heaven and it's going to be revealed in the last time. You have been distressed by various trials, so they had their trials, so that the proof of your faith, this one of those virtues, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's at his second coming. And so obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul. Therefore, keep your eye on the prize. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace, and I'll just say, which is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, at the second coming. Keep your, keep your hope fixed on that grace that's going to come to you at the second coming. So he's saying this way back at, you know, in the first century. You guys now, start now. Fix your hope on that grace that you're going to get at the second coming of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also um, in all your behavior, which is driven by your characteristics, right? Your character will drive your behavior. And so he says, uh, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. So Weldo talked about the present truth. This was the present truth then, when Jesus preached it, it was the present truth when Peter preached it, it's still the present truth. It should be the present truth, okay? And what he's saying there is all this stuff, it's, it's here a little and gone, here a little and gone. Your life is here a little and gone. This world is here a little and gone. It's all very temporal. And you know, as Waldo said, whether the second coming comes while he's alive or not, he's getting close to his second coming, right? And, and a lot of us are. In reality, all of us are. So how should we then live? In, in chapter 2, he says, abstain from fleshly lust. Keep your behavior excellent. And... Oh, they all got messed up a bit. But you see, excellence is I put all the virtues at the top, and they were across the top, but um, different equipment here, I guess. So excellent. Uh, so keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So even your behavior may draw the unbeliever to know Jesus Christ, to give their life to him. And when Jesus Christ comes, they will be ready for him, okay? And then he says, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God and honor the king. So you see brotherly love, honoring all people. These all come out of those virtues. So to sum up, he says, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Now, these things don't come naturally. Do you, do you ever see this among all your coworkers and everything, that all these traits come naturally? How about in yourself? Do they just come naturally in you when you're dealing with some of those employees or, or coworkers? See, th these are things we need to work on in our life, right? So he, he says, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. You're called for this purpose, so you need to do these things so that you might inherit this blessing. You need to prepare yourself. So he says, for whoever desires to love life and see good days, 
Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Those are choices. He's saying, turn away from this, turn to this. Turn away from this, turn to this. That is you making a decision, hearing his word, making a decision in your own life that you're going to do those things. So then with this eternal perspective, how should we live? Um, he says, the end of all things is near. So he keeps coming back to that tone. The end is coming, right? Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another. So we want to serve one another. And then he says, do not be surprised at the fire your deal among you, which comes upon you for your testing. So they had, they had testing that came upon them. And they had a lot of trials. You know, Rome wasn't really that kind. The, 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 the Jewish church wasn't too kind to the Christians. They, they had a lot of persecution. But the Bible does say in these last days, there's going to be a lot of persecution. And so we need to take these words to heart. These are eternal words. They, they, they apply through all the ages. And even in between then and now, all throughout the earth, Christians have been persecuted. And some are, are facing horrible persecution even this day in other countries. So he says, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for the testing, for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the suffering of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the, and I don't have that verse. Anybody reading along can finish that verse for me? <laughs> it fell off the screen. <laughs> Let note to the other teachers. Our, our, our PowerPoints don't always fit perfectly here. <laughs> it, it, it worked on my tablet last night. Oh, hey, oh no, I can't see it's on there. Um, I, I'm sure it's talking about at the second coming. You'll be you'll be ready. Uh, at the revelation of His glory, you may rejoice with exultation. Okay, so that at the revelation of his glory, you may receive joy. So that is, that, again, the, that word revelation, the apocalypse is the, the second coming of Jesus Christ. So again, you know, these things are working something in you when you go through these trials, right? So he says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, he's not to be ashamed, but it is to glorify God in, in this name, okay? So when we suffer as Christians, it's bringing glory to God. And so don't, don't feel ashamed if you're suffering. And he says, for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. If the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So he says, okay, when these times are coming and we're heading toward the end, if the righteous are scarcely saved, what, what about the ungodly and the sinner? You don't want to be among that company, right? And he says, therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. So we want to trust in God and we want to be doing what is right. And so then in, in the last chapter of 1 Peter, he says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So the devil is out there, he's real, he's putting thoughts in your mind. You know, it says, uh, take every thought captive. You know, it's, it's, he doesn't walk up to you. You don't see a devil walk up to you and, hey, I want to tempt you today. It, it, it's, it's really the battle of the mind, right? The battle of the soul. And so he says, but resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, God, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So, just a quick around the room. What is the message and the present truth that we see in 1 Peter that we just went through? What do, you, what do you think Peter's trying to tell us? Did, did, what did you get out of this? What did you get out of what I share? Be ready. Be ready. 
and Jesus is coming. People get ready, Jesus is coming, right? Well, but we need to prepare. And we need to prepare, yes. But our, our preparation is the work. It, it, it takes effort, and it takes decision, and it takes an act of our free will, right? So what is the context and the purpose of Second Peter? So he, he tells us in chapter 3 what's the reason why he's writing this, this book now, Second Peter, the second letter. And he starts out, he says, or in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he says, This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord Savior spoken by your apostles. So he's telling them this book of 2 Peter, this letter, they didn't call it a book, it was a letter, he's writing, right? And he says, I, I, I just want to interject here in the middle of my letter that the reason I'm writing this letter is to remind you of everything from the first letter, right? And everything you've heard from the apostles, which was the word of the Lord, okay? And so take this to heart. So again, now it's still the present truth, right? It hasn't changed. And he says, we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention. We would do well to pay attention. This, see, this, sometimes we need to go back and realize this isn't Peter's word. This is God's word. So it isn't just Peter talking to the people that were living at that time. It's God speaking to all of us at this time, yeah. through time. And so he says, we would do well to pay attention to his word. Because that is the, the real truth, right? Know this first of all, know this first of all that no prophecy in scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Now, Wella went through a little bit of church history and we've seen how the apostles had, you know, Jesus preached absolute truth, right? And the apostles had his truth, and that was the present truth. And then through church history, we saw um, men, individuals, we saw organizations who changed the meaning of the word of God or the heart of God in how they presented it, all these things over time, but none of those changed the real present truth. Nothing in church history can change what is supposed to be the present truth and our present truth. So he says, um, but false prophets also arose among the people. So they already have started arising way back then, just as there also will be false teachers among you. And of course there's false teachers out there. If you go on the internet, you can find all kind of false teaching, all kind of weird theology, and there's churches built up around some weird theology, theologies all over. So he says, um, these false teachers will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And there are, there are even in Christian, born again, Christian churches, there are things that I call heresies that are very destructive and destructive to the soul for some people. And I think it, we kind of deal with some of it in this here as we go. So then he says, um, for if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, cast them into hell, and he did not spare the ancient world, but he preserved Noah, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and if he rescued righteous Lot, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Again, we're looking toward the second coming, the day of judgment. But he's saying, if God could do this, and then he did this for Noah. If God could do this, you know, and then he did this for Lot. Well, then in the last days, he can bring judgment and he can do this for the righteous, okay? And so... His, his eye is, is watching out for us. He's, he's looking over us. We are the apple of his eye in that sense, okay? And so he, he, he loves us, he cares about us, and he can rescue us in the time of temptation, right? In, 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 the, in the times of tribulation, in the times of persecution. He can be there um, as a sure comfort, a close friend, and, and uh, um, he, he's there to, to work with us and for us. So he says... Um, 
back to Swindar, back up to chapter three, where he said, you know, I'm writing this letter to stir, stir up your mind um, uh, by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand, knowing this. Then he goes on and after that, he said, knowing this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues as it was from the beginning of creation. So the last days are still, you know, whatever day, the last day, you know, whatever day the second coming is gonna come on, I'll put it, well, the exact day, that's gonna be the exact day. That day has, has been there. God has known that day since way back then. And he said it's gonna happen and don't be ignorant of it. Don't forget it, remember it, hold on to it. He is coming. It's not an empty promise, and so people that say, well, the second coming's already happened, or, you know, this world is the millennium. You know, there's people that teach that idea. No, he's going to come back. The second coming is still coming, and there's mockers. Of course, the world mocks us, you know, with their evolution. Hey, it's been billions and billions of years, um, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's been going on, and just know that. So when you hear it, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. I've heard it, and everybody for history has been hearing this, but he's still coming back, and I know that. So he says, this is now the second letter. Oh, wait a minute. Huh. Okay, so <laughs> down the bottom. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. So it's all happening, and we're still talking about the last days. Um, and so he says, since all these things are to be destroyed, everything, in this building, you know, um, doesn't matter what we do for the glory of God in our buildings and things we build, they're all going to burn up, right? You know, all the wood, hay, and stubble is going to burn up. Only that which is pure gold is going to remain. And he says, um, therefore, uh, let's see, so, so he says, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? There's one of those attributes. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. So what sort of people ought you to be, he said? What sort of person should I be? We should be asking ourselves when we read this, what sort of person then should I be? That's what he's saying. This, we, we need to internalize this and make it ourselves, not you, the church. What should you, the church, do? But what should I be? How should I be? What should I be looking at? How should I be seeking the Lord in prayer about this? He says, therefore, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. You, therefore, knowing this, be on your guard. Be on your guard so that you are not carried away. Well, if you can't be carried away, you don't need to be on guard, right? So you can be carried away. So you need to be on guard that you are not carried away by error, right? And so he says, and fall from your steadfastness. So be on your guard so that you're not carried away and fall. So we can't be carried away and we can't fall or he would not tell us to be on our guard. Um, he says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I have in the parentheses below, we must choose to grow. It doesn't come by osmosis. It doesn't come by just saying, hey, I'm growing today, right? <laughs> We need to choose to grow and do the things it takes to grow. If you're a gardener and you want your, your plants to grow, you might want to water them. And even better, you might want to add some uh, fertilizer, right? Give them some good soil to grow in, those kind of things. What do we need to do for ourselves that we grow in God? What do you and I individually need to do for ourselves that we grow in God? So... Through these two chapters, to two books, he said, we need to choose to do these things. We need to choose to prepare our minds for action, to choose to keep sober in spirit, to fix our hope completely on the grace to be brought at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We need to keep our behavior excellent among the Gentiles. 
We need to honor all people. We need to love the brotherhood. We need to choose to be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble, humble in spirit. And we need to keep fervent in our love for one another. And then we need to be on our guard so that we are not carried away and fall from our own steadfastness in the Lord, right? He says grow, we need to choose to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we need to be diligent to be found in him in peace. So I, I put that one last because this is what I'm teaching on, diligence. So we need to choose to be diligent. And he says, okay, so now this is the text. Okay, we did the context. Now we're looking at the text here, right? So he says, um, I'll just start in verse 2 of 2 Peter chapter 1. He says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Okay, so corruption comes by lust. So then he says, now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. King James says virtue. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control, King James says temperance. And in your self-control, perseverance or patience. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. So we need to be applying all diligence to do these things, right? To have these things, to become these things. Now, I'll be honest with you, before I was asked to teach this class, I've read this book, I don't know, probably a few hundred times in my life, and I just read through it like I'm reading an encyclopedia. And I never stopped, and I don't think I've had somebody t tell me how I needed to be diligent about these things and why it's so important that I be diligent about these things. I just kind of read over it, kind of as a, this is a, just, just talking to the church, to these guys back then, right? This is his word, and I don't know, maybe, has, has that been the experience for anyone else here, that, that you just kind of glossed over it, or you know, maybe I'm just numb, but anyway, that was my experience, right? And all of a sudden I read this, and I see how important it is that we are diligently seeking these things in our life. He says, because if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a good reason to be diligent. You want these because you want to be um, useful in, you know, for the Lord, right? And he says, for he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted. I was talking with somebody about this. I said, it's kind of like somebody who, when they get up to retirement age and they've never done anything for retirement, they knew that day was coming, in a sense, their, their second judgment in their finances is retirement, right? You're all sitting <laughs> at this place, and it's like, oh, I never saved a dime. I never thought about it. I just, you know, figured life would just happen. Well, we want to not be short sighted spiritually when the second coming is coming, right? When persecution is coming. You see, because the second coming, between now and the second coming is persecution, and there's something called the great apostasy, the great falling away. That's Christians falling away. Those are those that I guess didn't guard themselves so that they didn't be carried away and fall. So we need to not be short-sighted, so he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. He's forgotten the basics about just how he has been washed by the blood of Jesus. And it is to Jesus alone that I owe my soul, right? Um, he says, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent. So he said, be, be diligent to do all these things. He says all this now, and then he says, so therefore, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing for you. For as long as you practice these things, as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Yeah. He didn't say if you practiced them once. 
He said, but as long as you practice, you continue practicing these things in your life, in your relationships. These are relational things. These are all things dealing in relationships, right? You practice these, okay? Um, and he says, uh, for in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied for you. If you practice these things, the entrance into his eternal kingdom is supplied for you. It's, it's, that's like a promise. That's a promise. We should all go, ee! right? We got a promise. <laughs> if we do these things, I just got to do this stuff. You know what he said? I'm, I'm just helping you make it there, right? Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you, Peter says. I, this is so important to me that I want you to know that I will always be ready to remind you of these things that I've just been spending two letters about, and now that's not the end. I'm going to always be ready to remind you because it's so important to me, which means it's so important to God because this is his word, and he's put it in me to give to you. And so he says, I will be there to remind you of these things, even though you already know them. See, it is the present truth, and have been established in the truth which is present with you. See, you've been. this is the present truth. You've been established in it, okay? He says, I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir up, stir you up by way of reminder. I consider it right that I just keep, as long as I'm, that, what he's saying is, as long as I'm alive, as long as I've got breath, I need to keep reminding you guys of this. This is really important. And he says, knowing that the laying aside of the earthly dwelling is imminent. So he's looking at the end of his life, coming probably soon. And he says, and I also will be what? Diligent. He's going to be diligent that any time after his departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. He says, so I'm going to be so diligent to keep reminding you of these things that you need to be diligent of, that after I'm gone, you still will call these to your mind. You will remember it. It will be now in you and part of you. So he said, and besides this, remember back at the beginning of this, apply all diligence. So what is diligence? I mean, we do all this diligent stuff, right? What is diligence? So the New American Standard, the, the Greek word that's used here is, um, is translated four times as diligence, five times as earnestness, and once, uh, uh, and, uh, once as effort, I, well, I got my numbers mixed up. Anyways, you can see it's translated as hurry, effort, earnestness, diligence, okay? And uh, we, word study says it means to make haste, be eager, give diligence, to do your best, to take care, to exert yourself. That's what it means. So when you're reading this, that's the message that you, you know, there's that amplified version. I, 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 I know some people like that version. And I, I could imagine putting that there in those verses where Peter's talking about, do apply all diligence. It probably would throw that whole Weiss translation in, right? Um, and so we saw that diligence is found uh, four times in here. You know, he said, applying all diligence, you know, add these things to your faith and virtue and all these things. Be diligent about that. He says, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you as long as you practice these things. Okay, he says, I will also be diligent. And he says, therefore, beloved, since you look at these things, be diligent to be found in peace, you know, in him, right? So, so he uses that word, I, I, I'm guessing... Well, I, I don't have to guess because I've looked, but you, you go through the New Testament, you don't find that word diligent a lot of places, but you find it four times when Peter's saying, the end times are coming, Jesus is coming back, judgment's coming, persecution's coming, trials are gonna come upon you. So you need this in you. You need to be ready. You know, uh, put your game face on, so to speak, get ready. And uh, so, um, some questions here. Does the church or you feel the need to be diligent today in these characteristics? I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I would hope, I hope you understand it. I was blessed to be able to watch a funeral of a friend of mine here in Auburn yesterday who was a well-known uh, minister who had died. And it actually started at, I believe, two of them on past five o'clock. But the very last person to give the eulogy was the wife you know, get her experiences. And she was saying, they always share this at funerals that in our life, all of these things that we're doing, this was a very wonderful person, apparently, that it's like our ship. You know, we're putting all these things, our fellowship, our ship, and as the ship is leaving the shore, 
that you know, that way of she was saying that on the hospital room around the bed. His ship was leaving the shore and it was leaving and leaving and leaving. You could see him leaving, and she didn't want to let go because that's the love of her life. Mm -hmm. But she said, There's the other side, heaven sees that ship coming in. So there's yeah. two views of death. You have to let go, and then heaven is saying, They're coming, they're coming, you know, and they're there to receive you. That's so good. It's beautiful. I just remember you sick in church mm -hmm. that uh, the puny that thing was over us. Judy, go to that church. Yeah. But it was just, I thought if you, all the people could see that funeral and how the kids stood up and gave their testimony about, you know, and everyone's testimony. Well, that day is coming for all of us. It's coming for all of us if the second coming doesn't come first, right? It's, it's coming for all of us. So, what happened to diligence? Because I, I, I've been pretty lackadaisical through a lot of my Christian life. Um, a lot of Christians are, and so diligence isn't something I see as a, a common trait in the church. That's my opinion. You might see it differently, okay? but I, I can have my opinion there. So what happened to diligence? So uh, Weldon did a good job going through the, the, the church history and how um, as the apostles passed on, you had the... Uh, um, organizations, I'll just say, started, you know, and, and you also, you started these priesthoods, and all of a sudden, the priest would talk to God for you, and, and in fact, you know, in the Church of Rome, um, you know, up till 1965, the priest had his back to you, because he was talking to God, and you, he didn't even face you during the service, right, and when you'd go to confession, it was in a dark room, you'd tell your sins to him, and then he would talk to God for you, I guess, and then he would tell you what to do, but anyway, um, and then you do say these prayers and you're good. You know, it wasn't, oh, now you need to change your character, you need to do this, you need to add this to your life, you need to walk with God, uh, you know, these kind of things um, develop a godly relationship and a godly character. That was never taught to me in life growing up, right? And then in the Catholic Church, about 400 AD, this guy, Aurelius Augustinus, we can call him Augustine now, and he came along, and he's, he's really kind of like the father of predestinationism, okay? He really kind of, in a sense, codified this predestinationalism. And it started kind of spreading through the church. And uh, one good thing was, not about his, and, and he had some good things. He's not, a, he's not like the, the devil with horns on. He was a man of God. He has some good things he's known for, but... This is just a heresy that was creeping into the church, okay? It was creeping in, and I'm guessing maybe he got some ideas from somebody else. But this predestinationalism that um, can go to the point that God has decided before you were born whether you're gonna go to heaven or hell and you've got no choice in it. He's created some people to go to hell, and they don't have a choice, and he's created some people to go to heaven, and they don't have a choice. He will just, you know, oh, I'll cast out my grace to you and reel you in. No, not you. And, I'll, <laughs> and at the judgment day, some of you are going to go to hell, and the rest are going to come in and have fellowship with me. Fortunately, the Catholic Church at the Council of Orange took that part of his teaching and said, that's heresy. And anyone that believes that is anathema. So they did hold that, but they still taught, well, you just got to do all these sacraments and do all these things that are defined by the Catholic Church. It wasn't really about relationship and building your, your person. It was outward acts. For your, for your salvation, right? So the concept of diligence kind of left because of that. And then John Calvin came along and then he uh, planted his tulip, uh, the uh, five points of Calvinism, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace and perseverance tulip. And that really codified Calvinism. And I, I can personally talk about people that I know that were family relations who were born again, excited about God, sharing the gospel, and then bought into Calvinism and are talking with God today. And one of them actually told me when I met him, he was on drugs, he had, he had uh, beat his wife, divorced her, was living with somebody else, not walking with God anything, and I ran into him in North Dakota, of all places, he wasn't even from there, but I was back in North Dakota and oh, there he is. And he says, well, one thing I know, I'm saved because I can never lose my salvation. No matter what I do, I can't lose my salvation. The other, other relative, he was uh, you know, my dad's age, and 
he got saved and he was witnessing all this, but then he kind of started making some bad decisions with the Calvinism. And he told my dad, he said, you know, he says, I can even shoot somebody and I couldn't lose my salvation. And, you know, he walked away from God. He, he had no reason to hold on because he thought he's held tight. So he's not holding on and he's not persevering and he's not diligent. And I believe this has, has really spread through the church and sometimes we, we can do this ourselves. Well, you know, Dave White, he's a Christian and he does this so I can do this. Um, you know, Robert, he, he's a Christian and he, he's in worship and well, he does this so I can do that. Well, you know what the word of God says? They that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. We need to compare ourselves to the word of God. And what, what, what are we getting out of there and what is he calling us to? And so um, diligence has kind of fallen off. I think it's easier to fall into laziness than it is to fall into diligence, right? Yeah. Diligence is a choice. Laziness just kind of happens. Couch potatoing just happens, right? Um, so we need to be building our own character. And um, I, I really like this line at the bottom there, building your character so it outlasts everything else coming in life. You don't know tomorrow. You know the one who holds tomorrow, but you don't know what tomorrow brings. Job did not know what tomorrow brings. If you go read the book of Job, right? Most righteous man on the earth. You know, I mean, if he'd buy into Calvinism and everything else, he would have thought, I've got it made, nothing's going to happen to me. And all of a sudden, what happened? Total destruction of just everything he owned and his kids are killed and everything. And now it was the character that was in Job that, that held him through and all those chapters and all his brothers, his spiritual brothers telling him why, obviously, you're not right with God, or this wouldn't be happening. You, you didn't do right, you treated people wrong, you did something, and, and it was no, because God loved him so much, he was allowing this to happen to him. But they couldn't see it, he wasn't feeling it, but that was the truth, right? Yeah. And so we need to hold on to the word of God. And, and all those things, the end times are coming, the promises of God are solid, they're yea and amen, they're here, and his concern for us is real. And so he's used these two books to tell us, hey, get ready. Jesus is coming. Be diligent. Guard yourself. And build these things in you. And you know what? If you do, you build these things in you, you know what? Who's going to be blessed? Of course, you. But you know what's going to be blessed? Everyone around you. That's right. Everyone around you is going to be blessed. If you, you have all those characteristics defining your character, people are going to want to be around you. They're going to want to employ you. They're going to want to have you over. You know, they're, they're just, and that's going to bless you again, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I say this over and over. God doesn't ever command us to do anything that's not good for us mm -hmm. because he loves us so much. You know, so he commands us to do these things because he wants to build us up, to strengthen us. You know, it's like, like a, a, a wise, not like he is, a wise father looking at his child and, okay, I command you not to do this because, you know, down the road, this is really not going to be good for you. I, I'm really telling you to do this and commanding you order you to do this because when you're 20, you're going to be really glad you did these things, that, you know, and you practice these things in your life or... Yeah, and I think that's why diligence is so tough, right? Because in almost all respects, Christianity is playing the long game. Almost everything you do, even everything within Second Peter you read is like uh, self-control, right? We don't see instant gratification with self-control, right? We have to play the long game with all these things. And so in a, in, a, in a society today that we exist where instant gratification and selfishness are key, right? That's how you get ahead in this world. It's starkly different. In the Christian world is upside down, right? We talk about this all the time. And so I think that becomes a hard sell, especially to new Christians. That's why mega churches are so big, right? They they learn to worship the church service, not the one, the creator, right? They worship the fog machines, the skinny jeans, the big screens, right? Because they're being gratified. Like, how does the Jeep 
prop them on a rock and you're lucky, glorify God. It doesn't, it glorifies you and it brings in people that glorify the sheep, right? And so we started to come backwards because we, instead of teaching diligence, we teach how do you serve yourself? How do you make church more of your own product than it is God's product? And so the cell becomes tougher over time. Yeah. Andy? I would think in our country, part of the reason for loss of diligence is the prosperity we had. Because when you're, when everything's good, you don't have to press into God so much. You need God when it's, what things are for good, but when God things are way good, you don't have to worry about it as much. Yeah. So, when, you, when everything's going good, it's harder to be diligent. And that comes in because Chuck's side of that. Because when you don't, you're not willing to see what's going on. You're, you're not seeing that there's a big old hole or a ditch and you can step into it because everything seems to be going well, my next step's going to be there for me. And uh, that's, that's when the destruction will come. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, the principle applies in all over our life, right? I mean, dieting, finances, um, you know, exercise. Those things, you, you, you start any of those things today and you won't see a difference today. Right, right. But, you'll see the long-term value as the long-term goes by, right? And so that's the way we, we see all these things, you know, that, that Jesus said. And you know what? Just pick any of those characteristics that we had up there and say, okay, I'm going to be really faithful and diligent. Just try to work on one of them to start with, right? Yeah. And, and, see, and see how well you can actually practice that one thing daily, all day long, you know? Well, then add all eight or nine of those and you know, keep yourself a scorecard, see how well you're doing. You know, this is something that obviously, if you go into sports and you say, well, I want to be a good batter and fielder and runner, well, those are all different skills and they all take time to develop. Some will take longer, but you, you start out as a kid working on it and, you know, when you're in your 20s, you know, maybe you'll be on a college team or something, you know, but it, it's something that you have to build into your life you know, the, the other kid that's, you know, doing the, the video games, he's not going to be the, the guy on the team later, right? I mean, in general. So, I'll open up for questions, comments. Well, I, I was just thinking, just listen to Peter talk to his message there. Peter was not diligent early on. Do you remember when he was denying Christ and all that? Yeah. And what did Christ say? Hey, when you're converted, Strengthen your brother. Yeah. He, his diligence was just a character trait that just happened. Right. It was something that he developed until he was saying, I'm going to be diligent about reminding you to be diligent. Yeah. You know, and so his diligence was revealed, and he was doing what God told him he would be doing later on. And sometimes we, we think it's just going to happen, miracles going to happen, and fires and bright lights, and all that's our diligence. Yeah. yeah. But it, it, it's just like a, a maturing process. It's investing your time, you know. Um, remember, uh, T Trevor talked about how we invest our time, right? And, and it's how you invest your time is what you're going to reap in reward. Helen. Well, we know Jesus is the pattern, and we Anything else? Anybody? Robert? Can I, I give you another analogy uh, similar to the, the seamstress? Um, playing guitar, music. Um, I was taking lessons from this fella at one point, and um, it was a totally different approach for me. This guy was very uh, scholarly, you know, he was into music theory and trying to show me that. And I'm like, at that time, I was monkey see, monkey do kind of player, where he you know, put your finger here and put it here, and, and uh, so he's talking to me in the in the in the lesson, and he says, if you take this approach and apply it to your playing, it will uh, 
it will transform the way you play. In a couple of years, you'll be just a monster player. And my first thought, though, was a couple of years. <laughs> you know? I, I wanted it like now. And, uh, but it's the same kind of thing. If right. you're pursuing Christ, you you don't uh, you're, you're you can play a long game. You know, this is this is an investment. These things are valuable in themselves. It's not uh, like you're going to arrive overnight and be some kind of uh, yeah, yeah, definitely so. Um, I think that was my last, yep, that's my last slide. Um, so I just want to pray and ask God to bless this. Father, you are so precious to us. You, you are diligent to warn us of the days ahead, diligent to encourage us and to share with us the things we need and to give them to us as we seek you for them. So, Father, I pray that as we go this week, that this will be in our prayer life this week. It will be in our prayer life and our uh, decision-making processes, Father. That we, we've become more and more like your son, Jesus Christ. We'll have more and more Christ-likeness formed in us from day to day, and it will be a living process. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.